Hi there. In the previous episode, we discussed scalars in scikit-learn that could take a data set that's like this, with uh, very different scales on the x and y axis, um, into something that's perhaps a bit more normalized, where uh, these axes are actually a little bit more comparable to one another. And this can be uh, preferable from a numeric point of view for any machine learning models that follow. Now, in particular, what we're looking at here is the result of the standard scalar. And what it does is it effectively takes every single point, it subtracts the mean, and then it divides by the standard deviation. And it does this for every single axis, and that is the way that we go about scaling the data. It's not the hardest thing mathematically, but this is what's happening under the hood. However, there are a lot of details to this once you start going deeper. And as we'll see in this video, this standard scalar really isn't that standard. There are a couple of extra things that scikit-learn does under the hood in order to get this to work. Because your initial thought might be, well, the way that you calculate something like this is relatively easy. You have the numpy mean function that you can use and you can pass some sort of array to that. That gives you this uh, mean over here. And similarly, we can also do that for the standard deviation. And that'll give us this symbol over here. So this might feel easy, but let's now go to the docs uh, for the standard scalar over here, because that'll quickly explain to us why this implementation won't cut it. All right, so here is the documentation for the standard scalar. We can see the class definition here. We have a pretty elaborate doc string, but we also see that there are a couple of inputs. In particular, you can see that we can shift the mean or use the standard deviation to scale. But you can also mix and match. You can choose to only use the mean or the standard deviation to scale. Just from glancing at that, that doesn't sound like too big of a deal, but there's actually a little rabbit hole of subtlety here already. And to explain that, uh, let's just have a look at the fit method that belongs to this uh, component. So I've scrolled down a little bit uh, to show you this fit method over here. And there are two things that I would like to point out. It says here that we are computing the mean and the standard deviation to be used for scaling later. However, when I look at the input that this component can expect, then it seems that we can expect something array-like or a sparse matrix that goes in. And sparse matrices are always just a little bit interesting. And to maybe explain that, there are these matrices with machine learning data that I can come up with. And let's say that we had something that was one hot encoded and that we have four classes, let's say. Well then, we could have a dense matrix with lots of zeros here and maybe a one once in a while. But this would be a very expensive way to store the information. By putting these zeros in this dense array, we are actually allocating memory because we have to remember what the value in each slot here was. But if this were a sparse array instead, then internally, we are only keeping track of the slots that actually have a value. And then we assume zero everywhere else for all intents and purposes. But because we're only keeping track of uh, these filled in values, we are really saving a whole lot of memory. However, here comes a tricky thing now though. So if I were interested in calculating these means for all of these different columns, as in, I want to calculate this mu over here for each of these columns. Well, I could do that. And I could use that to then uh, transform this data set into something that is indeed scaled. But then I will be turning something sparse into something dense. And I might incur a very big compute penalty if I'm not careful. So that might make you wonder, why does this component allow for a sparse matrix to go in? And this is actually explained in the doc string. Going back to the top of the document, you can find this sentence that explains that if you want, you can set with mean to false. And this means that we won't be able to shift the mean, but we are still able to scale the standard deviation if you would like to. This way, the output of the standard scalar definitely remains sparse. But a cool thing here is that scikit-learn is taking extra effort such that if you were to have a use case where this fits, the standard scalar is actually able to accommodate that. This is really, really cool to me because it means that you can apply the standard scalar in more places that you would perhaps consider initially. 
But I do think that this is kind of a nice example that shows that the standard scaler does more under the hood. It's not necessarily standard. There are all sorts of edge cases that it tries to deal with. And if we have another look at the fit method, uh, we can spot another one immediately. Notice this extra thing over here. This fit method also allows for something called sample weight. This is something that's not unique to the standard scaler. A bunch of models and pre-processing steps inside of scikit-learn allow for this. But effectively what that allows you to do is it allows you to add some weights to each data point. So let's say I've got data point one all the way up until data point n. And then what I can do is I can say, well, you know what? This first data point, that's twice as important to me as maybe this last data point. The thinking here is that next to this data set that I start with, I have this uh, sample weights vector that I can use to tell my pipeline uh, to value different data points slightly differently. And there you go. This is another reason why you have to do more than the standard calculation. If you want to allow for this, and mathematically there's no reason why this shouldn't be possible, you are again going to have to adapt the implementation. However, this is something that scikit-learn supports, and that is great. But to me, it's not the most mind-bending thing that the standard scaler does that is actually somewhat non-standard if you think about it. So you might wonder what I'm talking about, and it's all revolved around this method over here. The partial fit method. The partial fit method, again, is not something that's specific to the standard scaler. A bunch of components in scikit-learn have support for this. But this method indicates that we can do this thing called online learning. The data can also be presented in a sequence of batches instead of in a single batch. And this is where we actually have to apply a little bit of math in order to even get this to work. So let's dive into this partial fit business just a bit. Normally, you might be used to doing something like uh, fit and then predict inside a scikit-learn. The fact that this works is great, but notice that we are giving all of our data in one go here. We have a single batch. And that's totally fine, but sometimes that batch doesn't fit in memory, in which case you would like to maybe chunk it up. Maybe you have your big X array, and you would like to chunk that up into smaller portions, and then you would like to feed that portion to a machine learning algorithm one at a time. And this is what partial fit is for. You would have your estimator, you would first fit on the first subset, and then you would take the estimator again, and you would partial fit it on the next batch, etc., etc., etc. Now, the interesting thing about this API is that it has to work, even in an extreme case. And in this case, the most extreme case of splitting up your data set that I can think of is that this has to work on data sets that just have a single data point in it. Put in another way, uh, the standard scaler needs to be able to learn one data point at a time as well. And that requires us to do just a little bit of math. Because for one part, this is going to be relatively easy. Um, what I can do is if I have this stream of numbers that pass by, let's say, then what I could do is I could keep track of the number of numbers that I've seen so far. So I've seen one number, two numbers, three, four, five, etc. And I can keep track of the sum of all the numbers seen so far. So in this case, I've seen the number one. Here I've seen five and one, so that'd be six, nine, 13, etc. And this makes it such that the mean at some time step um, is just these two numbers divided by each other. So I would have one over one here. I would have six over two here, nine out of three here, 13 out of four here, etc. Because the mean is just the sum of all the data points divided by the number of data points, this is a relatively easy thing to uh, articulate in an online fashion. This is a little bit harder for the variance though. There is this formula that you could go ahead and use, but if I wanna use this formula directly, I need to do some rewriting and separate out some parts in order for it to be similar to what we're doing here. Again, I need to be able to learn one data point at a time, so this formula needs to be rewritten in such a way that I only deal with components that I can update as new data comes in. And right now, it requires me to have the mean at the ready that I can subtract from every single data point in my collection. 
So that won't work. So what you could do is you could do the math, or you could look it up. It's actually a fun math exercise if you're interested. But it turns out that this can actually be rewritten. If you properly do the math, then this formula can be split into a part that requires the sum of squares of all these different numbers, and the square of the mean. And these two components are things that we can accumulate one data point at a time. So at this point, you might think, okay, that's pretty cool. Scikit-learn did a bit of effort in order to get this right. As a user, you don't have to be that knowledgeable about all this math, which is nice. But the rabbit hole actually goes a bit deeper again. Now to show that this rabbit hole can actually go a fair bit deeper, um, I've actually made an implementation of the math I've just explained. So the way that this function works is I am uh, given a array of numbers. I'm looping over uh, all the numbers in that array. And every time that I see a new number, I update the number of numbers that I've seen so far. I update the sum of all the numbers so far, as well as the sum of the squares of all those numbers. And then I'm yielding the statistical information that's relevant, like the mean and the variance, uh, which will also give me the standard deviation. Then when I give that function an array of uh, random numbers where I know the mean and the standard deviation, then, you know, there is some convergence that has to happen. But at some point, especially when I've seen lots and lots of data, then yeah, the mean of 10 and the variance of one, uh, these are numbers that I would expect. And I'm learning this one data point at a time. So, so far so good, you might think this is pretty neat. But now I'm going to do something that's just slightly cheeky. Uh, I'm going to pass in a big number. And you'll notice that when I do this, uh, this entire setup just breaks down. You can see that I get the mean kind of in an okay way. But the variance, that really goes bananas quite quickly. In fact, the numerics of this are so unstable that I even get negative numbers out. You might initially be surprised by this, but then when we have a look at what's happening here is I am calculating the square of a large number. And when I calculate the square of a ridiculously large number, I get an even more ridiculously large number out. So that means that I have to deal with numerical instability if I'm going to be updating in an online fashion using this rule. And I think this is a particularly interesting phenomenon because even if you get the math right, having it right on paper doesn't mean that it will be usable in practice. You will still have to deal with these numerical issues and scikit-learn also wants to be able to support large numbers. So, so what does scikit-learn do? Well, it does some more math. It turns out that you can rewrite this formula such that you don't have to calculate this square. It does require you some math and it also requires a slightly different implementation which I've done below here. And just as a quick demo, uh, I can show that if you were to use this alternative implementation that you then get something that is indeed more stable. The variance no longer jumps around like it did before. But what I hope at this point is that you do appreciate the rabbit hole that you would have to dive into if you wanted to implement this yourself. There's actually a lot of details that do tend to matter. Because scikit-learn is a library that's been around for a few years, it's also a library that's seen a bunch of these edge cases, and it's also got a wide crowd of a community that contributes good ideas. And this, I think, is a nice example of it. There are use cases when you might want to perform a partial fit, but it would be a shame if your algorithm fails because of something numeric that is happening under the hood. And I hope that the previous example did show that even when you get the math right, that's sometimes not even enough. I suppose as a way to wrap this video up, I think one final thing that might be good to show is the source code. When you go to the documentation page, there's this button that you can click that will take you right to it. And here I am inside of GitHub looking at the current implementation of the standard scaler. And one thing that I can do is I can scroll down and I can have a look at how fit is implemented. And when I look at the implementation down over here, the interesting thing is that it is really using partial fit under the hood. There is a function over here called reset that resets the internal state before fitting. But really the stuff where everything is happening is inside of this partial fit function. The thinking here is that if you're only going to be calling fit once, 
Well, that's kind of like calling partial fit uh, once. And then when you have a look at this partial fit implementation, you'll also notice some extra information in the doc string. In particular, you'll notice that there is a reference to the algorithm that is being used under the hood for the incremental mean and standard deviation. It is equation uh, 1.5a in this paper over here. Now, having a link like that to an academic journal, I think is very nice because it allows someone like me to just understand what is happening under the hood. But I also hope that by this time, you're able to look at the source code with a renewed sense of appreciation. There are lots and lots of edge cases that you might be interested in. And in the case of the standard scalar, that could be that the X over here has sparse data in it. That could be that you're dealing with sample weights, but it could also be that you're dealing with a data set that doesn't fit into memory and that you're interested in using partial fit instead. And scikit-learn is able to handle all of that using decades of computer science knowledge. And as a user, that's something that you don't necessarily have to deal with. The main point I want to drive at here is that scikit-learn does a lot of stuff under the hood that you might not even be aware of. And that's actually a huge feature. The standard scaler is not standard because of all the edge cases that it's able to handle. And you don't have to worry about that as an end user. And that, I think, is definitely worth appreciating.